the Sabbath day. What is the Sabbath day? Where does it come from? What are the roots of the concept? Uh, we find it delineated in the Ten Commandments. It's one of those great big ten that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Depending on if you're a Roman Catholic or a Protestant, you'll number it either three or four. Most Protestants will number it as number four amongst the Ten Commandments. And it goes like this. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now that's just the beginning of the commandment. That's what most people know. When you had to memorize them when I was a child and when I was in confirmation class, I had to memorize the Ten Commandments. And that's all I had to memorize. But actually there's much more than just that. You'll find it in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. And it reads like this. Remember, sa remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant, or your livestock, or, your, or the sojourner who is with, within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the Sabbath day, the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That's Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. So how do you keep the Sabbath day holy? What does it mean to keep it holy? Well, it says it here in Exodus that uh, we, we, we get to not have to work. And not only us, it's not that we get to sit back and watch the football games and make our kids work. Our kids don't have to work. Hear that? I know, I tried that on my dad when he said, you know, you need to go mow the yard. Didn't work then. Well, sorry. It does say your children don't have to labor or work. Your servants don't have to labor or work. Your animals. Good news for my cat, Tabitha, my dog, Fanny, you don't have to work. Hmm. Visitors in your community, the, 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 the uh, migrants who come into town and work in the fields, they don't have to work on the Sabbath day. In fact, it's commandment, thou shalt not work on the Sabbath day. And that is how the Old Testament covenant delineates keeping the Sabbath day holy by not working on that day, by doing no labor on that day. Now, rules pretty quickly grew up as to what it meant to not work or what it meant to work because there are some things that simply have to be done on the Sabbath day. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the exceptions is given actually by Jesus here in our reading where Jesus says, uh, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? Good news. Uh, my cat and my dog have good news. They, I get to work to give them water on the Sabbath day. In other words, anything that is necessary to save life or keep from harm would be allowable to some degree. Hence, if your ox gets into the ditch, you can get it out. You can coax it out. You can't lift it or drag it, but you can coax it out. If it's thirsty, you can give it water. If you've broken an arm, you can bind it so it isn't further injured, but you couldn't set it. Ooh, fast knitting would result in you having to re-break it ooh, to get it right. To this day in Israel, they have kosher <laughs> elevators, Sabbath day elevators that are constantly running. If you go to a hotel that caters to both locals and to, and to visitors, to tourists, and to non-Jews, they'll have some elevators that are constantly running. They stop on every floor on the way up and every floor on the way back down. You don't have to push a button because they said pushing the button was work. 
And so you'd see this massive line at the elevator, at that, that the, Sabbath, the, seventh, the Sabbath day elevator there. You see this massive line there all gathered around, all the Jews waiting to get in, and a bunch of Gentiles come up to the other elevators and hit that button, the doors open, and that line breaks, and they all go into the other elevator with you. And then they'll say, could you hit floor six, please? Could you hit floor three? Could you hit floor five? At the Prima King's Hotel in Jerusalem, they had seven floors. Could you hit floor seven? Hmm. What about things that couldn't be helped? Like chickens that lay eggs. The rule was that you could, uh, you could not eat an egg that was laid on the Sabbath day. But, but you could eat the chicken that would hatch from the egg. Wow. Huh. No scrambled eggs, but you could certainly have chicken fajitas. That makes perfect sense. Hmm. In other words, there were many interpretations of the law. In fact, most of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy is comprised of interpretations of the Mosaic Covenant, of the core of the covenant, covenant of the Ten Commandments, and how they live themselves out. And that's true especially of how to keep the Sabbath day. And there are exceptions, many, many exceptions to how you live out holiness and keeping the Sabbath day holy. What does that mean, word mean? Keeping it holy. If it means not working, what does that in and of itself mean? How do you keep it holy? You keep it holy by keeping it set apart. That's what the word means. Set apart. In, in, in the Greek translation, it's translated agios. It means to make something holy, to set it apart, literally to place it on the altar for God's use. Hmm. And yet, Jesus, seeing a woman who was bent over, literally hunched over in this possessing illness. Sometimes Luke will conflate the concepts between a, a possession of demons and an illness and make them one and the same. And this is one of those examples where, where Dr. Luke will put them both together. And we have this conception of Satan so oppressing this woman, she's bent over for 18 years with this affliction. And Jesus said, you hypocrites, you'd, you'd let your ox out and lead it to get water, but you wouldn't heal this woman, this daughter of Abraham, who's been plagued for 18 years and set her free from bondage on the Sabbath day. And in essence, Jesus is indicating that this is indeed the best and most perfect way of keeping the day holy. The best manifestation of keeping the Sabbath day holy is to do God's work on the Sabbath day. To relieve the suffering. To deliver those who are ill. To unbind those who are bound. In other words, we are called to set that day apart to make it holy by giving it to God. And what better way of giving that day to God than by reaching out with hands of grace and healing, binding up, making whole again, making whole that which has been broken, making whole that which has been divided. And this woman with 18 years of painful illness, affliction is made whole on this the holy day, the Sabbath. Jesus is here manifesting something we see elsewhere in the Gospels. Jesus here is manifesting that he is the Lord of the Sabbath, the, 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 the one who gives the Sabbath true meaning and true place for us. You see, Sabbath keeping is hard for us in this modern world. There are so many things you have to do. Once you're done working throughout the week, what do you do? You go home and work. You do laundry. 
I did six loads of laundry yesterday. It's amazing how much laundry can pile up over three weeks, isn't it? <laughs> when I was in school, when I was in, uh, in college, excuse me, in graduate school, I was doing a semester of clinical pastoral education. And clinical pastoral education meant you go to class, took three classes, regular schedule, and then you'd go over to the hospital to Duke Medical Center and you would do your clinical pastoral education work. You'd do your rounds on your floor. You'd do your CPE units. And some of those involved being there overnight. And if your schedule was poorly timed, you had no time at all to do anything. You'd go from class to the hospital and then back to class the next day without going home. And pretty quickly, the dirty clothes piled up. And so, rather than taking the time to do laundry, me, ingenuity incarnate, would go to Target and get extra underwear. <laughs> so that when I came home from graduate school back to Texas, and my mother was helping me unpack, she discovered that I had 74 pair of underwear. <laughs> and 25 years later, it's finally all been thrown away. <laughs> Rather than working on the Sabbath day, when I would go home and crash, rather than doing laundry, I just went and bought more. <laughs> We're called to set aside time, Sabbath rest time to God. And it is very difficult in our society to do that, especially with communications being what they are, especially with social media being what they are. You go home, you're still working. You're doing email, texting, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, putting up pictures from church functions, communicating with people on the phone, on the Internet, constantly. Sabbath rest is incredibly difficult to find. But we must find it. First of all, it's a commandment. And it's a commandment for our own good. And secondly, if we don't, we will, if we do not set aside time wholly for God, we will discover we have no time at all. What is the Sabbath day? What day of the week is it? You ask many Christians, many of them will say Sunday. But historically, the Sabbath day is Saturday. The last day of the week is Saturday. Sunday is the first day of the week. The Jews observe Sabbath on Saturday. We have trouble concepting of that because we don't use the word Sabbath for Saturday. But there are languages that do. Sobotu in Russian is, is Saturday, the Sabbath day. Sabado in Spanish, Sabbath day. Other languages, we use the Latin words, Saturn's day, <laughs> Saturday. Hmm. So how did Christians come to look at Sunday, the first day of the week, as being Sabbath day? Or treating it like Sabbath day. How do we get those blue, remember the blue laws? Some of you are, if you're my age or older, you remember the blue laws. You could buy a nail, but you couldn't buy a hammer on, <laughs> on Sunday. Isn't that weird? You could buy food, but you couldn't buy stuff to cook it with on the Sabbath day, under the old blue law. On Sunday, under the old blue laws. How do we come to understand Sunday as the Sabbath day? or experience it, or view it as such. When in reality and in history, it's Saturday. Our, our friends in the Seventh-day Adventist church and our friends in like Baruch Hashem, the, the Masonic Jewish Christian church, understand the Sabbath day is Saturday. They worship on Saturday. How did we, as most Christians, come to understand Sunday as a Sabbath day? Well, it's simple. The earliest Christians were Jewish Christians. They were Jews. And they viewed Christianity, their Christian faith, as a denomination of Judaism. And so they would go to Sabbath services at the synagogue. They would attend synagogue. And they would hear the scriptures read there. 
They would engage in the standard procedures and listen to the preaching there and their fellowship together with their fellow Jews. Even though they were Messianic Jews, even though they were Christian, Jewish Christians, they were nevertheless still Jews and they would go to synagogue. And then the next day, on Sunday, they would meet in their house churches to hear about Jesus, to fellowship together, and to receive Holy Communion every Sunday, every first day of the week. Why? Because every Sunday is a little or mini Easter. It is a time to recognize, to celebrate, to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus yet again, week after week, throughout the whole year. Not just once a year on Easter Sunday, but throughout the whole year. That first day is a celebration of the resurrection. The day after the Sabbath day. And, because, and it, is because, it is that because that was the day he was raised. In the morning, either just before, during, or right after sunup on Easter morning, Sunday morning. So every Sunday becomes a little Easter, a little celebration of Easter Sunday, again and again. Some languages incorporate that whole concept into the name for, East, uh, for Sunday. Like Russian. In the Russian language, the word for Sunday, and this survived the atheist communist era in the Soviet Union, the Russian word for Sunday is Voskresenya, Resurrection Day, Voskres, to resurrect, to be raised, Voskresenya, the Resurrection Day. Wow. So a day named Resurrection. What happened was, following the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 A.D., Judaism, in order to survive without the Temple and without Jerusalem, had to coalesce around their only remaining social and religious institutional structure, the synagogue. And the synagogues were spread throughout the entire eastern half to the middle portion and even over into the western half of the Mediterranean Sea Basin. And Judaism, was going, if it was going to survive outside of Judea, if it was going to survive outside of Jerusalem without a temple, it needed to have a core, a central focus for the religious and cultural life, and that core and central forces focus already existed in the synagogue. And so those who ran the synagogues, Pharisaic Judaism, essentially got to say, if you want to be one of us, you've got to be one of us. No more Sadducees, no more Essenes, no more Zealots, no more Christian Jews. You're just going to be Pharisaic Jews. And Judaism coalesced into a fairly monolithic conception of Judaism. Now, it's redivided in multiple denominations today. But at first, they had to become Pharisaic Jews, coalescing around the synagogue. And there was therefore no more room for those who looked upon Jesus as the Messiah. They had to leave if they were to continue to worship Jesus as the Messiah. And so Christians and Jewish Christians were being thrown out, forced to leave the synagogues, forced to abandon their synagogue worship on the Sabbath day, but they continued in their house churches the worship of Jesus on Resurrection Day, the first day of the week. And in this process... Christians began to think of the first day of the week as a Sabbath day, with Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath, being the one whom we celebrate in his resurrection on that day. And then that speaks to us. For yes, Saturday is the Sabbath day and will always be the Sabbath day, but for Christians we recognize setting apart the day of resurrection as holy for the Lord of the Sabbath, who is Jesus Christ. Our Lord. Let us all find time in this coming school year. Let us all find time throughout the rest of our lives. Let us all find time to find days of holiness. Find days to set apart for Jesus. Find days to set apart for God. Let us set apart a time. A time of Sabbath rest. For me that means turning off the cell phone, not looking at Twitter, not looking at Facebook. That means setting aside all that stuff 
and spending time with God in prayer and in scripture, with friends and fellowshipping together, spending time making it holy again. I want to challenge you to make some time. If it's not a whole day, then a part of a day. Make some time, set it apart, and make it holy for you, with your family, with your faith community, with God. Let us do that and commend it to the Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. listening to a sermon by Dr. Gregory Neal, Senior Pastor of the First United Methodist Church in Commerce, Texas, and Rector of Grace Incarnate Ministries. Copyright 2016 by Dr. Gregory S. Neal. All rights reserved. For more information and for other sermons by Dr. Neal, visit us on the web at www.revneal.org. That's www.revneal.org. You are also invited to visit us in person at First United Methodist Church, 1709 Highway 24, Commerce, Texas, 75428. This program was produced by Dr. Greg Neal.